examine the faith of David. I've been greatly challenged by, by the example of David, his faith. And so I just want to bring all that in here and kind of shower out on you what God has been speaking in my own heart and life. And I, I pray that God will use it in your life experience in the way that God is using it in my own life experience. I hope that we'll all be stronger people of faith and understand biblical faith more so that we can operate in faith on a day-by-day -day basis as we live for our Lord. This faith of David that is seen particularly in 1 Samuel chapter 16 through, verse, through uh, chapter 31 uh, is a great model of, of true and sound faith. Now if you were here last uh, Sunday, you know that I, I shared with you an outline of what I'm doing over these next several weeks. Just looking at five facts about faith 
that I see exemplified in David and his experience as we work our way through uh, these chapters. What we saw last Sunday about faith is that faith waits. Faith waits. It just trusts God and waits on God. After Samuel anointed David to be the king of Israel, David did not rush into Saul's throne room and say, Saul, I'm now your replacement. Get off of the, the uh, throne of the king of Israel. I'm here to take that spot and I'm going to rule in your place. Bye bye. No, that's not what he did at all. What did David do? Well, he just kept on keeping sheep. That's what he did. And he waited on God to put all the things together. And David did not see all the dots, and he certainly did not see how God was going to be connecting all those dots, but he just waited on God. And he kept waiting on God even through some very difficult times. And we're going to really, really be focusing in on that for a little while here this morning. He trusted the Lord. He did not take matters into his own hands, but he just kept waiting on God and trusting God. That was the first faith fact. Now this morning we're going to look at at faith fact number two, as we see it exemplified in the life of David, and it's this. Faith may cause suffering. Faith may result in suffering. Now that's a flip message to what so many people have heard and are convinced is true. Their idea that is, well, if I'm living by faith, if I'm exercising faith in the Lord, then then my faith will keep me from suffering. And if I ever find myself in suffering, then faith is going to get me out of suffering. But that's not what we find biblically. And that's not what we find in the Bible. Now, certainly, please don't misunderstand me. There are many circumstances that you and I would not have to go through that are difficult and damaging and hurtful if you and I would put our faith in the Lord and trust Him to get us out. This poor man cried. David said on another occasion in Psalms, this poor man cried. The Lord heard him and saved him out of his trouble. In Psalm 40, the Bible says, I waited patiently upon the Lord. He, he heard my cry. He brought me up out of a miry pit, set my feet upon a rock, and established my going. So there are times that when you and I will, will call upon the Lord in faith, God will intervene in our life, and He will bring us out of those negative circumstances, and He will bring us into more favorable circumstances for our life. But there are other times that your faith is going to get you in trouble. And God intends for it. Now that's not, that's not what a lot of folks want to hear, but that's biblical. The faith of David put him in some very tough situations. I taught the student ministry this morning in life group, and that's one of the things that we talked about. And I asked them to start naming some people that because of their faith, that they had a very tough experience or, or, or life. And readily, one of our students spoke up and said, said, Job, look at Job. Why did he suffer? Because he didn't have faith? No, he suffered because he was a man of faith. God said to the devil, have you considered my faithful servant Job? Out of all the people on the face of this earth, when God wanted to put somebody up before the devil, to get under the devil's skin and to slap the devil in the face, he brought Job up. And then what kind of a life did Job have? Suffering on top of suffering. We can't imagine all the pain and all the heartache that Job went through. And it was all the plan of God for his life. The Apostle Paul, when Paul was saved, Ananias was told by God, you go and you pray for him, and I'm going to show Paul all of the great things that he's going to suffer for me. All the things he's going to suffer for my name's sake. When you study the testimony of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and in time for this, we may even read some of those verses later, but when you study the testimony as Paul is talking about what he has experienced as a Christian, and he talks about the times of his imprisonment, and he talks about the times of being beaten with whips, and he talks about those times when, as he would share the gospel, that they would stone him, 
and try to kill him. All the things that he went through. He went through those things because he was a man of faith. Not because he did not have faith. On and on and on we could go as we talk about people who have suffered because of their faith. You see, true faith is not just wishful thinking. And true faith is not just making a, what we would consider to be a positive confession in the face of our difficulty. There are those who will tell you, well, you just start making positive confessions. Listen, you, you, cannot, you cannot put words in God's mouth. When, when you and I are exercising faith, then we are trusting God in His character and in His working to do what God wants to do in a situation regardless of whether it's easy or tough for us. And when you are exercising true faith, you're not taking your word and exalting it, but you're taking God's word for what it says. You're not putting words in God's mouth and trying to twist God's arm. It's not that you and I are trying to get our will done here in this world, but we are exercising faith that the will of God is going to be accomplished in our life and in our circumstances. That's what real faith is. And real faith just trusts God in the, in the easy times and it trusts God in the hard times. It just continues to trust the Lord. Well, let's see this exemplified in the life of David. Our, our first passage that will be on the screen will be 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 9 and following, but let me give you the background of the uh, previous three verses of Scripture there. David has just killed Goliath, okay? There's been that battle, the Philistines and, and the Israel, Israelite soldiers out there, and David, this young boy David goes out before all those Israelite soldiers who were so terrified of Goliath and so afraid of, of, of the consequences of their taking Goliath up on his challenge, and David goes out there and David, of course, by the power and the blessings of God, uh, removed the enemy of, of the armies of God, God's people Israel, in that situation. All right? Verse 6 tells us that David was returning from that context, coming back into town after killing Goliath. And the women, the Bible says, came out from all the cities of Israel to meet King Saul. Because Saul's coming back with his armies and David is with them. And they are singing and dancing with tambourines. Why? Because if the Philistines had conquered the Israelites, then all of these people would have been subject to the Philistines. They would have become the slaves of the Philistines. And they would have suffered greatly at the hands of the Philistines. And so there's great reason for them to be celebrating. And so these ladies are out in the streets and they're dancing and they're, and they're playing their tambourines and they're rejoicing with shouts of joy and on, on stringed instruments. So they're playing these harps and they're celebrating. Verse 7 says that as they celebrated, the women sang, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Uh-oh, that will get you pride. Saul, the king of Israel, has been victorious, but David has been ten times more victorious than our leader has been. Verse 8 says that Saul was furious and resented this song. And he complained that they only credited me with thousands. What more could he have but my kingdom? What more could David get than, than getting my kingdom? He's already got all this recognition. So verse 9, let's build this straight. Verse 9. So Saul watched David jealously from that day forward. I remind you that in the heart of God, God had already rejected Saul as the king of Israel because of Saul's disobedience and sin. And so, and so David was already in the wing to become the replacement for King Saul. And Samuel had already told Saul that he was being rejected and that he would be replaced, although Saul did not know at this time fully that it was going to be David. The next day, verse 10, an evil spirit, that's a demon, Okay? A demon. The next day, an evil spirit from God. What this means is that this evil spirit became the tool in the hand of God. It's not like this evil spirit was warning to cooperate with God and trying to do righteous things. 
Oh no. But God in His sovereignty even uses that which is evil for His good and His ultimate plans. And so the next day, an evil spirit from God took control of Saul and he began to raid inside the palace. You know, we can read in the New Testament about some people being demon-possessed and they're, and they're doing all these very bizarre things, you know. And, and some have great physical afflictions because of, of demons and demon possession and demons afflicting them and all of that. But sometimes it's like it is here with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul here had a demon working on him. And you know how the demonic work was manifested? He had a temper tantrum. That's what it was. I mean, he just could not control his rage, his anger that would come up in his heart and his mind. It was demonic. And so he's raving inside the palace. And David was, was playing. Of course, Saul probably didn't even realize it was a demon that was working on him emotionally and mentally, but it was. And so David was playing the harp as usual, but Saul was holding a spear and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. I'll throw this spear through him and I'll pin him to the wall. But David got away from him and if you underline anything in your Bible, underline that word twice. He threw it at him two times. I don't know what David was thinking. He would have to throw a spear at me one time. I'd be going out the door. But he threw it two times. I don't know if maybe David was just in shock. And then, you know, surely this didn't really happen. And it happened, and it happened again. But actually, we're going to find that it happened three times. Twice in this context. And then on another occasion. Where Saul tried to pin him to the wall uh, with, a, with a spear. So, wow, suffering. Why? Because God was setting David up to be king. David was living a life of faith. David was living a life of commitment to God. David was following the Lord and he was putting his trust in the Lord. And as he was on his faith journey, the king of Israel was determined to kill him. So in spite of David's faith, he had great adversity. Moving on down, we find in, uh, in verse, well, verse 12, Saul's afraid of David. And it says, because the Lord was with David and had left Saul. And so that intimidated Saul greatly. So what did Saul do? Well, Saul's trying his best to get rid of David. And so God, uh, they, uh, Saul reassigns David and made him commander over 1,000 men. And so he puts him in this high-ranking position with the military. And why was that? Because he saw David as a, as a great military commander? No. He wanted to get David killed. He thought, I'll put him in, in this role and I'll put him out there on the front line of the battle and David will end up losing his life. But the Bible says that David led the troops and continued to be successful in all his activities because the Lord was with him. Verse 15 will be on the screen. When Saul observed that David was very successful, he dreaded him. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he was leading the troops. So uh, Saul told David, here's my oldest daughter, Mary. I'll give her to you as a wife if you will be a warrior for me and fight the Lord's battles. That sounds really good, doesn't it? That sounds very complimentary, doesn't it? But oh, what the motive was in Saul's heart. But Saul was thinking, here's what was going on in Saul's heart and mind. My hand doesn't need to be against him. I don't have to pin him to the wall with my spear. My hand doesn't have to do this. Let the hand of the Philistines be against him. I want him dead. But instead of my killing him, I'm going to let him die on the battle. I'm going to let him go out there and I'm going to let the Philistines take his life. I won't have to worry about him anymore. 1 Samuel 19 verse 1 will not be on the screen, but if you've got your Bible open, notice what's said there. The Bible says that Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. I mean, he had a war now. The bounty had been assigned. Command had been given. David is to die. You've got to kill 
15. 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 9 through verse 12. You're going to see, you're going to see again. The Bible tells us here that an evil spirit again from the Lord came on Saul. And uh, he was sitting in his, in his uh, palace and had a spear in his hand again. This is that third time Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear. Verse 11 says, Saul sent agents to David's house to watch for him and to kill him in the morning. So they had, he had an ambush set around David's house, waiting on David to come home so that they could kill him. And then David's wife, Michael, warned him and helped him to escape. So, wow. A life of faith is not going to keep you from being in danger. A life of faith does not mean that things are going to be easy. A life of faith may cause you some suffering. But are you buckled into your seat? Not only may your faith cause you to suffer, but the people who are associated with you may suffer because of your faith. Because you are a man of faith. Because you are a woman of faith. It may very well be that not only will you suffer, but other people may pay a high price because of your faith in the Lord. And you talk about that being exemplified in our text. Is it evident? Look with me, if you would, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And uh, we're going to see some, some truths here. David is on the run. Okay, David's running from King Saul. David's running for his life. He's trusting God. He knows that God is with him. And that God is taking care of him. But he's doing pragmatically what is right. He's, he's on the go. He's not just sitting by to be a, a, an easy target for Saul. He's trusting God, but he's doing what's right as he is trusting the Lord. And, and David goes to Ahimelech, who was one of the, the uh, priests of the Lord at the city at Nob. That's 1 Samuel 21 and verse 1. Hitting the highlights down in verse 3, we find that David asked Ahimelech to give him five loaves of bread uh, for the soldiers who were with David. And uh, Ahimelech ends up giving him the consecrated bread. And that's in verse 6. Time doesn't permit me to get into the details on that. And, and while David is there with Ahimelech and talking with this high priest, then one of Saul's servants, okay? One of Saul's servants, a man who is fully committed to King Saul, one of Saul's servants detained before the Lord, and no one really knows uh, for sure what's meant there, other than probably this is just a reference to the sovereign hand of God. God called, caused this servant to be there at that place at that time. But uh, that can't be proven. That's exactly what that means. But anyway, that's, that's the inclination that I have with that. He was there on that day. His name was Doeg. Would you like to be named Doeg? The Edomite. Chief of Saul's shepherd. So he oversaw all of the sheep. Of the kingdom. So he was a man of, of, of great prominence and, of course, well known by King Saul. David asked Ahimelech in verse 8, Do you have a spear or a sword or something that I can have? And, uh, and Ahimelech says, You know what? The sword of Goliath that you used to take Goliath's head off, I've got it. Now, how he got it, we don't know. We don't, we don't know how this happened. But he has the sword of Goliath that David used to take off Goliath's head. And the, and the scripture here tells us that he says it's wrapped in the cloth behind the ephod. The ephod was a, a, a vest that would be uh, worn by, by the priest. It was a vest that would come down below the, the waist. And so obviously this was a, a, a storage place where these linen ephods were, would be kept. And he had the sword of Goliath wrapped up in the cloth, hiding it behind the, uh, the uh, priestly ephods. He says, wrap the cloth behind the ephod, verse 9. If you want to take it for yourself, then take it, for there isn't another one here. And David, of course, uh, took it. Now, chapter 22, verses 9 through verse 19. Verse 9 says that Doeg, the Edomite, was in charge of Saul's servants. And he answered, I saw David, I saw Jesse's son come to Ahimelech. 
And Ahimelech inquired of the Lord, gave him provision, gave him food, and gave him the sword of Goliath. Saul's blood boils. This priest, Ahimelech, who is supposed to be loyal to me, is feeding David. He is asking God for God's blessings and God's guidance on David. And he even gave David Goliath's sword. And so Saul is mad about all of that. Verse 11, the king sent messengers to summon Ahimelech the priest. And so he says, he's coming in here. I'm calling him in on the carpet. Right? Ahimelech's going to have to answer for what he is doing, his conspiracy, by supporting David, who I consider to be my number one enemy. Verse 16, making a long story short, verse 16, the king said to Ahimelech, you will die, Ahimelech. You and your father's whole family, all of you are going to die. Why? Because of David's faith. Because of David. David following the will and the plan of God. And his association with Ahimelech, which was so very innocent, was going to cost Ahimelech his life. Verse 17, Then the king ordered the guard standing by him, Turn and kill the priest of the Lord, because they sided with David. For they knew he was fleeing, but they didn't tell me. But the king's servants would not lift a hand to execute the priest of the Lord. The servant says, No, these men of God, we're not going to take their life. And so they are, they're really stepping out on a, on a limb themselves to say to Saul, no, we're not going to carry out these orders. We're not going to kill God's priest. Verse 18, so the king says to Doeg, okay, this informant, go and execute the priest. So Doeg the Edomite went, obviously he had people with him, went and executed the priest himself. On that day he killed 85 who wore the linen canvas. Eighty-five priests were executed because of David's faith. He also struck down Nob, the city of the priests, with the sword. Look at this. Both men and women, children and infants, oxen, donkeys, and sheep. You say, preacher, I don't like that. I don't like it. These people suffered because they were associated with David. And David was living by faith. You see, your faith not only will put you at times in suffering that you would not have otherwise, but deal with it. Your faith may cause somebody else to suffer. Our living for the Lord does not make us immune to problems. Sometimes our living for the Lord will bring problems upon us. Sometimes our life of faith will bring great suffering to us. But I've got good news. I've got about five hours of material to give, give to you, but we'll nail it down in a couple of minutes. You can persevere. You can press on. It doesn't matter how tough it gets. It doesn't matter how hard it gets. You and I, through faith, can persevere regardless. Regardless of what price we pay because we are men and women of faith. We can persevere. And God can be honored and God will accomplish His purposes in us as we persevere. How is it that we can persevere? You and I can persevere because we know that God is with us. The reality of God being with us gets us through. God being with David got David through. 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David. The Lord was with David. If you're a man of faith, a woman of faith, I promise you, and it's not my word, it's God's word, God is with you. And God will see you through. Chapter 18, verse 14, the Bible says, and continued to be successful. David was successful in all of his activities. Why? 
because the Lord was with him. God made him successful. Verse 28 of 1 Samuel chapter 18, Saul realized that the Lord was with David. 1 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 4, the Bible says, once again, David inquired of the Lord and the Lord answered him. You see, God can be talked to and God will hear and God will answer. That's why we can persevere. That's why we can be strong. God hears us as we pray. 1 Samuel 23, David's on the run from Saul. David's going from place to place and Saul pressing to try to catch David and to kill David and to execute David. But the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 23, verse 14, the last part of verse 14, but God did not hand David over to him. Saul would chase after David, thinking David was in one place and David would be somewhere else. God was just continuing to protect David and, and God would not hand David over to Saul. And on one occasion, as, as David is confronting Saul for the way Saul was treating him and how David has been uh, in full allegiance to, to, uh, to Saul and that Saul's uh, coming after David was unjustified, David says this to Saul in verse 12 of 1 Samuel 24. May the Lord judge between you and me. And may the Lord take vengeance on you for me. But my hand will never be against you. You see, David's trusting God. David says, I don't have to fight this battle. God's going to fight it for me. Saul, you need to understand that, that my hand will not be against you. And it doesn't have to be because God's hand will be against you. Because you've come against me and I'm serving the Lord. See, you and I can put our trust in the Lord and know that God is the one who oversees. God is with us to guide us, to give us wisdom, and to protect us. And you and I can persevere because God will give us the strength in our heart and in our soul to keep on keeping, regardless of what comes our way. 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 6 says, But David found strength in the Lord his God. Strength is there. Strength is there. You and I, as we live our life of faith, we find the strength of God. As the Apostle Paul was, was suffering from some severe malady in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and he's praying, God, please Take this from me. Take this from me. Three times he agonized before God. God, take this infirmity from me. And God says, uh-uh. No. Because my strength is perfected in the context of your weakness. And I'm keeping you weak so you'll know my power. I'm keeping you humble so you will know my power. And so how did Paul respond to that? He says, bring all the afflictions. I will glory in all of my life's difficulties so that the power of God can rest upon me. You see, faith is not the way to avoid trouble all the time. Faith, faith is, not, it, it, is not the power that prevents difficulties from hitting us head on. Sometimes our problems come to us because we are people. And sometimes problems come to the life of people who are associated with us because we are people. But regardless of what you and I go through as Christians, as people who know the Lord and are seeking to honor and serve Him, you and I can persevere regardless of what comes our way because the Lord is with us. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us the Lord says that He will never leave us, He will never forsake us. And because the Lord is the strength of our life. He is our strength. He is our power. Let's stand together and pray.